Rebecca LeBeau. I have to do a mic check. Are we good? All right. I've always thought I should wear one of these. Um, <laughs> thank you. So for some time now, I've really loved talking about opiates. Um, I could talk about opiates anywhere, at any time, with anyone. And I recognize how that sounds. But the opiate epidemic took the lives of 200,000 people between 1999 and 2016 and counting, making it the leading cause of death in people under 50. To put it another way, in 2017, more Americans died of overdose than HIV, AIDS, gun violence, or car crashes ever in the United States in a single year. How can you not stand up and take notice? My interest in addiction really didn't start with opiates, though. As an undergrad, I found myself drawn to alcohol addiction. Uh, there was alcohol abuse in my family, like many families, but I didn't recognize that as a push for me at the time. Um, I'm the youngest of six kids, and although there were always people in my house, I feel like I was brought up a bit like an only child. And what I mean by that is I was protected, protected and sheltered from unpleasant life events. And I maybe was afforded some things that my siblings weren't, most notably personal time with both my mom and my dad. My grandfather was a violent alcoholic. But I think, <laughs> and this may be a dream in my head, but I think he was sober most of my life. And so all of the chaos and the damage that his drinking caused, I didn't have to see. And if it did happen in my lifetime, I was sheltered by it, not just by my parents. My siblings took on that role, too. And alcohol abuse didn't end with my grandfather. Other people in my family abuse alcohol, some more obvious than others. And I didn't get away scar-free, because no one does, even if you think you do. But I really didn't recognize that this is what pulled me or interest, made, made me really interested in this field. And now I get the pleasure of teaching undergrads about substance abuse. And it is incredibly rewarding, and I'm grateful for the experience. But I've noticed over the past 10 years a change. Each year, as my students come in, I ask them, how many of you, by show of hands, have been affected by the opiate epidemic. Earlier on in the 10 years, a few hands would go up, maybe up to half as time went on, and it would be someone distant from them, maybe a cousin, an uncle, or a friend of a friend. Today, this semester, 100% of the hands went in the air, and it's people much closer to them, even sometimes in their home. It's a different world. One of the things that I love about teaching is that I, help, I get to help my students to understand that no matter what role substance abuse has played in their lives, no matter how difficult or how personal it's been, it is not only safe, but it's important that we talk about it. Removing the stigma of addiction is critical in recognizing that we are all more than one thing. Talking about it helps us to remove that stigma. When we characterize someone using a single term, we begin to see that person through a lens that they eventually see themselves through as well. And the danger is that over time, we're not capable of seeing them without the lens. Imagine for a minute what it feels like to have one word describe everything about you. A word that is meant to sum up everything that you do and who you are. Maybe a word that you've heard yourself referred to as. 
Does that word describe you all the time? How does it feel to be labeled, even in a small way? We tend to categorize people, or we're categorized ourselves. And it happens without us even thinking about it, oftentimes. But it's impossible, right, to put people's multitude of character into a single word. We can't characterize someone's identity using one word. Certainly not mine, and I would assume you'd say not yours either. And remember, we're talking about opiates. So when you're thinking about or you're talking about addiction, don't let that be the only thing that you use to identify that person's character either. We are all a number of things to a number of people. We're sisters, we're daughters, we're fathers and sons and cousins and aunts and students and teachers and, you know, everything. You get the point. And when you look at someone one-dimensionally, it's dangerous and it's unfair. So I'm going to put this really simply. <clears throat> let's not do it. Collectively, let's make a change in the way that we think about and we talk about people with addiction. And let's do that with our friends and family, and they with theirs, and on and on. Let's start a new trend where we don't pigeonhole the multidimensionality of a human being into a single word. And let's call out our friends and family when they do and recognize. <laughs> Thank you. Recognize that we are all more than any one thing. What's really great about this is we can take this beyond the individual. We can do this in groups as well. So as you know, I'm a Rhode Island worker, and so I want to welcome everyone in Rhode Island, doctors and nurses, um, social workers and counselors and researchers and addiction specialists to come together and fight the stigma as well. We need to tear down our walls and create space for true collaboration. We are in crisis mode. Rhode Island is sixth in the nation for number of overdose deaths annually. We must stop working in separate teams and work together against this crisis. In Rhode Island, we are, or we could be, in a really unique position to lead the charge in the opiate crisis. We are a small state. We can touch a lot of our population. And we've done this in a few ways already. And I'm only going to name a few. There's lots out there. So don't be insulted if I miss anything. Um, one of the things we've done is we've gotten medically-assisted treatment, MAT, which is buprenorphine or methadone, into our adult correctional institution. And subsequently, we've reduced overdose deaths on the release population by 60%. It's a big deal. We've also gotten naloxone, or Narcan, the overdose reversal drug, into the hands of our pharmacists and, on, and friends and family of active users. These are important interventions. We are saving lives when we do these things. But we are just scratching the surface. We are working with people who are already struggling, and we need to, and we've been put in this position. But it's time to come together, pool our collective knowledge, and start working toward prevention and education as well. The opiate epidemic has claimed a lot of lives. People are dying every day to such an extent that the life expectancy in this country has decreased. That's the world that we live in right now. You can't ignore it. These are our fellow humans, and they are struggling. We know what perpetuated this particular crisis. Oxycontin. Pharmaceutical companies 
created Oxycontin. And they marketed it as a long-acting medication that relieves pain for up to 12 hours. It's this long-acting piece that they use to misrepresent the abuse potential to practitioners and consumers. They also use this long-acting piece to say that it's less likely to be abused, and therefore people will not get addicted. The pharmaceutical company that created Oxycontin began making a billion dollars annually. And they did this with very strategic marketing toward general practitioners with little training in the field of either uh, treating pain or of understanding abuse and addiction in patients. So not only did they misrepresent the abuse potential for these new medications, they pushed them harder than any other drugs in the past. And very strategically to practitioners with little familiarity in the field. They used tactics as well to get practitioners to prescribe these medications much more liberally. They recruited young, attractive sales representatives to market their new medications in doctor's offices. They brought with them lavish gifts. Think big here. Vacations, big. Um, they, they paid for expensive lunches and dinners not just for the docs, but for the supporting staff as well. They made sure all of the swag in the office and around it had the label of the new medication. They even went to some extremes. Doctors are busy. They have to go from office to office. They would meet doctors at gas stations, fill their tanks, and sell their medications there. And it worked. These medications were prescribed more liberally. Prior to this long-acting pain medication that relieves pain for up to 12 hours, only people with cancer or other terminal illness would receive this level of pain medication. Now we're seeing the high school athlete who's working really hard to keep their grades up and get into college, and they get injured and they tear a rotator cuff, or they blow out a knee or an ankle. They go see their doctor, and they're prescribed some type of oxy. We are compliant consumers. We trust our medical field. We get our prescription, we fill it, and we take it. And the next thing you know, the next thing that they and their friends and family know, they've lost everything they've worked for to the need for this drug. And yes, this can happen with one prescription. They're addicted. This is a crisis. This is one of thousands of similar stories. There is a mass of addiction that sweeps the nation. People are prescribed these medications, and they become addicted, and they can't access them anymore through their doctors. So they get them other ways, from family, from friends, <clears throat> excuse me, or they start to buy them on the streets. Prescription pain medication is very expensive on the streets, and oftentimes people have to turn to another drug in the same category, heroin. So we're getting wise to this now. We're seeing that people are dying. The overdose death rate is skyrocketing, more than we've ever seen before. And so we start looking a little deeper into these companies and into these medications. And it takes some time, but eventually, the pharmaceutical companies are brought to justice. And they pay, they admit to misrepresenting the abuse potential. I don't want to leave that out. And they pay a multi-million dollar fine for all of the lives that they have altered or destroyed. Millions of dollars sounds like a lot of money. But when you're making billions, it doesn't even slow you down. You go back to your office, you get rid of a few key executives, and you keep on profiting. So earlier this year, we hear at the national level, 
they're considering the death penalty for drug dealers. Wow. That feels really extreme. It also feels like we may have missed a few steps along the way. Oh, and by the way, they're not talking about the same drug dealers. They're talking about the heroin dealers uh, peddling in neighborhoods, not the drug dealers that are making billions of dollars while aggressively pushing their products. I'm not saying I agree with the death penalty, but I haven't heard about anyone from Big Pharma doing jail time. But we are good and ready to make an example of the other drug dealers. We need to hold all drug dealers responsible. <laughs> Paying a fine that you can easily afford hardly feels like restitution. And it also tells us who the government sees as dispensable. What's really appalling, if you needed anything else, is that we are targets as consumers. We go and seek help when we are sick or in pain. And we, again, we have faith in our medical community. Do no harm, right? And this has played out to such an extreme in the opiate crisis that we can't get out of cleanup mode. We can't get to prevention and education, like I mentioned earlier, because the death toll has not slowed down. Where does that leave us? Well, I'm glad you're all here, because you're all going to be part of this. We need to talk about it openly. We can't be afraid of it, and we can't ignore it. We need to change the stigma and the shaming that surrounds addiction. And remember, and remind others when they forget, that these are our fellow humans, and they are suffering. They are more than just addicts. This didn't happen simply to hundreds of thousands of people. There were very specific circumstances that created this crisis. Pharmaceutical companies using money and power to manipulate the system, push doctors to prescribe, and get an excessive amount of a controlled substance to the masses. The time is now to change the stigma that surrounds addiction. We need this to move forward. Thank you. <laughs>